Welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast, your monthly source for conversations and curated content to improve your law practice with your host, Rocky Deer. Hi, and welcome to the State Bar of Texas podcast. We're celebrating a birthday today, specifically the big 3-0. I wish I was talking about myself. Actually, I'm not sure I ever was 30 in the first place. I sometimes think I went from age 25 and just skipped to being somewhere in my 40s, like a really evil game of shoots and ladders, as if to say, shoot, I'm in my 40s. But I digress. We are recording this episode on November 7th, 2019. 30 years ago on this very day, for the lazy among us, that's November 7th, 1989, the Supreme Court of Texas and the Court of Criminal Appeals issued a court order known as the Texas Lawyer's Creed. If you've never read it, You can find a link to it in the description of this episode. No, it's not a rule of professional conduct. It goes beyond that. But don't take my word for it. Let's hear instead from a couple of actual experts. We have with us today Buck Files and Kenda Culpepper. They led a successful effort in 2013 to get the Supreme Court of Texas and the Court of Criminal Appeals to reaffirm the creed. They will help us dig a little deeper and remind ourselves of the, pardon me for saying this, the need for the creed. First, a little background on Buck and Kenda. Buck Files is a past president of the State Bar of Texas and is also a Hall of Famer, specifically the Texas Criminal Defense Lawyers Hall of Fame. He practices in Tyler, Texas at the firm of Bain, Files, Jarrett, and Harrison. Perhaps most importantly, though, Buck served in the United States military for four years as a U.S. Marine. So we owe Buck a debt of gratitude for his military service. That service will become even more relevant in just a bit. Next, we have Kenda Culpepper. Now, full disclosure, Kenda and I have known each other and been friends for almost 20 years, so you'll forgive me if I brag about her just a little too much, but there's a lot to brag about. Kenda is the district attorney for Rockwell County, Texas, and by the way, she's the first woman to take office as a DA in the history of North Texas. Pretty cool, huh? She's also the former chair of the State Bar Professionalism Committee. Her work as a lawyer and bar leader has earned her a certificate of merit and a standing ovation award by the State Bar, and Oh, and remember the capital murder trial of the former Justice of the Peace who killed the Kaufman County DA a number of years ago? Yeah, Kendo was on the prosecution team of that case. That team won the Lone Star Award for their work on that case as well. So now that you're convinced we have two really heavy-hitting guests, let's talk about the Texas Lawyers' Creed. Buck and Kendo, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Thanks. Thank you. So, so Buck, let's, let's walk back now to 1989, November 7th. There was obviously some kind of a need for a Texas Lawyers' Creed. Can you tell us why? I mean, take us back to that that time and tell us why we have this thing called the Texas Lawyers' Creed and how it came about. I can't say that I was really a witness to what was happening back then. I was totally engaged in the practice of criminal law. And in criminal law, we just didn't have the Rambo folks that we hear about in the civil uh, practice. I talked to judges out of Dallas who had been defeated uh, for re-election, and they were sitting as visiting judges and were bemoaning the fact that civil lawyers didn't behave in the courtroom the way the criminal lawyers did. And I'm not being critical. That's just what these judges were saying. So there was obviously a need uh, for some standards, and the um, Lawyers' Creed certainly provided those standards for the lawyers who probably needed the advice. Now, what what force and effect does this creed have? You know, I, either one of you can jump in on this one, but is it enforceable? You know, why should lawyers pay any attention to this? Well, I think that the the creed says it best. Um, it is inspirational. It's there's nothing enforceable necessarily about the creed except a lawyer's own desire to be the best at his profession, and and I think that actually the creed even says that. You know, it's not enforceable in court and that sort of thing. But the creed, it's a beautiful document. Um, If you haven't, if the people listening to this this cast haven't read the creed, I would encourage them to go and pick up this beautiful document and read it for themselves. It is a an inspirational document, and and the words in it they go to the very core of our profession and talk about what we should be um, in this profession as professional lawyers. No, absolutely. Well, you know, and it's and it's interesting, Kinda. You talk about the beauty of the document. I mean, it's 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 not just it's it's not a short document. I mean, for those who've read it, it's broken up into the different sections. And one of the ones that that kind of caught my eye was saying that lawyers 
In fact, I'll quote it. I commit myself to an adequate and effective pro bono program. It also says, I am responsible to assure that all persons have access to competent representation regardless of wealth or position in life. It sounds like this is really, this kind of goes back to why a lot of us went to law school in the first place. Is that what you find so attractive about it? Well, I, I think so. And I think that the fact that, I mean, it, there's just so much to this document that when I was thinking about being a lawyer and wanted to enter um, a profession for which I had a great deal of respect, it certainly echoes the things that, that I thought about when I wanted to be a lawyer. Certainly, the, the creed was, was promulgated and written before I was a lawyer. And so I think that it's interesting to hear about that history of how the creed evolved. Um, I was lucky enough to be on a panel with some of the, the people that created the creed, Fred Hagens, Blackie Holmes, Lamar McCorkle, and to listen to them speak about what the environment was and what created the need for the creed, as you said earlier, it's actually kind of astonishing to hear. And I think that from the perspective of those gentlemen, they had come from a time when the practice of law wasn't easier, certainly not easier, but it was, it was a simpler time in terms of the profession of law. You didn't have technology. You didn't have the email system. You didn't have the harassing discovery that we hear about. And so it was, they were able to remember that time before the malicious actions that were happening in the 80s, that Rambo, the Rambo litigation or the Rambo tactics that I heard about in law school, they were able to see the time before that period of time and the time that they were in. And I think that that's what encouraged them or urged them to move forward. And, and Buck, you lived through that period of time. I would imagine that you felt the same. Kendall, one of the differences is that defense lawyers always negotiate from a position of weakness. And so consequently, you can't have some of the Rambo tactics and the criminal uh, side of the hall that you do over in the civil. We you know, wind up... Um, being aggressive, being zealous, representing our clients, but Rambo just doesn't work in the criminal justice system. Uh, there are a few lawyers who think that's the way to practice law, and normally they are less than totally successful. Yep, and you and I have had this conversation before about the difference between civil and criminal law. In criminal law, we practice together every single day. Rocky, we're, we're in the courthouse with the same lawyers every day, day in and day out, um, whether you're in an urban area or in a rural area. And so if you are that Rambo litigator, that tactician that thinks that being aggressive and malicious is the way to go, the lawyers are going to remember you when you have a case tomorrow. So it is a lot less effective, I think. It's not even that position of weakness. It's just less effective for a criminal practitioner to have that kind of Rambo tactics because everybody in the courthouse is going to know that they were a jerk by the end of the day. Civil litigators, on the other hand, and, and I see it even today. I, I speak a lot on professionalism, and I, and I hear about the tactics in the civil world. Um, they see each other maybe once a year, maybe never. This may be the only case they're ever going to have. And so I think that they feel like there's more of a rationalization to being ugly towards each other. I, I think that it, it ends up hindering them um, to a great degree with judges and, and other lawyers that know them. But I, I think definitely the civil and the criminal world are very different. Let's go back to 1989 when this creed was being, when it was being formed and it was being developed and finally it actually came to pass. You, you know, Buck, you've mentioned that at that time lawyers and, and from what you've described, it was largely on the civil side of the docket. You know, th things were getting more Rambo-esque and for those that are not familiar, Rambo was a big movie back in the 1980s, so that's probably where that term comes from. But let's talk for a moment about when did that transition happen? Because we've heard here about there being a time before time when things were civil and lawyers did work well together even on the civil side. But now we're hearing that somewhere in the 1980s that started to change. Do you have a sense of why it changed and what brought that change about to where we had – you had this need to kind of remind everybody about civility and professionalism? In all honesty, no. Tyler was small town USA. We had a bar that um, had the reputation, if you could try a case in Tyler, you could try a case any place in America because we had federal courts here who required civility. So I never did see the Rambo-esque tactics uh, that obviously were around the state and certainly in the larger counties. So 
Tyler was, um, I'm sure, not unique, but we just didn't see that here. Do you think Tyler sees it now, Buck, where in 2019, 30 years later, do you think the lack of civility has kind of crept its way into Tyler as well? I don't believe so. You know, when you address the court, you stand. You say, may it please the court. Before you leave the uh, courtroom, you say, that's all the business I have with before the court. May I be excused? Uh, judges are addressed as your honor. Clients are told uh, the last two words out of your mouth uh, will be your honor. Yes, your honor. No, your honor. Guilty, your honor. Whatever, your honor. In the uh, the criminal courts here, um, I think civility is high, high, high up there. And quite honestly, there just aren't that many civil trials here. And when there are, it's uh, unusual. So we don't see the Rambo stuff here in Tyler, Texas. And I think that there are jurisdictions, Rocky, that that the judiciary takes a more active role in the civility in the court. Tyler may be one of those places. I know that, that Rockwall County is. I hope it is. But I think that that is so important um, when you're walking into the courtroom that the, the you know that the judiciary is not going to take kindly to uncivil behavior within the courtroom. That, you know, the creed talks to the fact that you owe the court um, respect and that you have a duty to show that respect to the court. And so I, I think that the role of the judiciary is important in making sure that the lawyers know when I walk into this courtroom, if I am uncivil or I'm unprofessional or, or I don't dignify the court with the respect that it, des- that it deserves, the judge is going to let me have it and possibly even in front of that jury. So um, that's something that we've talked about a lot is that the role of the judiciary is very important in encouraging professionalism within the courtroom and without. When we got the lawyer's creed reaffirmed by the Court of Criminal Appeals and Supreme Court uh, five years ago, uh, at one of the judicial conferences, we had copies of the lawyer's creed for any judge who wanted them. It was interesting at the number who did, and it was interesting at the number who didn't. But there are some judges who will send counsel out in the hallway to look at the lawyer's creed and then come back in and behave. I remember one down in uh, Galveston that I talked to. Then there was Judge Berry, who was the chief judge of the uh, Western District. He said that he had a copy of the lawyer's creed under the glass on each counsel table, and since he put it there, he never had a problem with lawyers. The rest of the story is Judge Perry never had a problem with a lawyer before he put the lawyer's creed out. (laughs) (laughs) You know, but we also talk about, I've talked to different judges throughout the state, too, and we're, again, we're, we're doing that now. We're encouraging them to put a copy of the lawyer's creed not only in their courtroom, but also in the jury room. And and Judge Laura Livingston is a judge out of Austin, um, tells a great story about that the lawyer's creed is posted in the back of her courtroom. And two lawyers came in, they were arguing, they were in front of the bench arguing with each other. It was just ridiculous. It was very unprofessional. And she finally had had it. And she said, okay, both of y'all go to the back of the courtroom and read the lawyer's creed. And you just get this visual of these two lawyers just kind of skulking to the back of the courtroom (laughs) to read the lawyer's creed. And then they come back and they work things out. And I think that sometimes it's just a matter of reminding lawyers what their duty, not only to their profession, but to themselves are. Well, let's let's maybe talk for a second about this process of getting the lawyer's creed reaffirmed in 2013. I think Kenda, you and you and Buck were both kind of spearheading that effort. Can you guys tell us all a little bit about why you felt the need to get it reaffirmed and kind of how you went about the process of getting it reaffirmed? When I came in as state bar president, it had been um, 25 years since the creed was promulgated. We had had about 30,000 lawyers uh, admitted to practice since then, and many of them were not familiar with the lawyer's creed. So one of my goals was to go around the state, talk to judges, talk to my liaisons from the Court of Criminal Appeals and the Supreme Court. I talked to 372 judges, either in uh, chambers or at the bench, about the importance of the lawyer's creed. I only had five uh, who were opposed to it, and they said they just didn't want to be told to do something that they should be doing on their own. Working with uh, Judge Kiesler, my liaison to the Court of Criminal Appeals, Judge Phil Johnson, my liaison to the uh, Supreme Court, uh, and also with Chief Justice Jim Worthen of the Council of Chief Judges. Uh, I was really happy when um, 
the courts uh, and the Council of Chief Judges uh, agreed to reaffirm the importance of it. One of my favorite things in my hall is a picture of the Lawyer's Creed that was printed, and it has my picture with Jefferson and Keller, and it uh, it's real special to me. And Kenda, tell us tell us your perspective. So I think that my my experience stems off of that of Buck's. Buck uh, did me the honor in 2012 of appointing me as the chair of the State Bar Professionalism Committee. And he and I uh, had been friends for a long time. I can tell you that Buck Files is one of my personal mentors and heroes within the profession of law. And so when he um, asked me to be the, the chair of the professionalism committee, I took that very seriously, and I wanted to make an impact with my service on the professionalism committee. So he and I had long talks about how we could impact the state bar and the profession of law within the state of Texas. And that was one of the things that he had thought about. And I can tell you that in 2012, um, I had been a prosecutor in Dallas, and I was uh, a defense lawyer. I ha- had been a defense lawyer in, in the Dallas area until 2008 when I was elected as the DA. And until 2012, I had never heard of the Texas Lawyers' Creed. Now, I came in, I was licensed to practice in 1992, three years after the Texas Lawyers' Creed was promulgated. And in that time, when I was a prosecutor, defense lawyer, I had never heard of the Texas Lawyers' Creed. So when he was talking about his desire to to revamp and repromulgate and kind of re-energize this Texas Lawyers' Creed, that was exciting to me because it was a document I had never read. When I went and read it, I thought, how is it possible that I never have heard of this document, let alone read it? It is uh, it's truly a beautiful document in my mind. And it really goes to what the things that I have always thought about but never been able to say. And so um, I was excited to join him in that effort to repromulgate that and take it to the Court of Criminal Appeals and the Texas Supreme Court. And seriously, I I was just a support um, for him. He was the go-getter of the group, certainly. But we lent our strength. And in our committee, we had some very strong members in the professionalism committee. They still do. And so uh, I was just I was just there to to lend support to that effort, and and incredibly proud uh, of the work that Buck did to repromulgate that, and and to get the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals to realize that the Texas Lawyers' Creed had kind of fallen into disuse among so many segments of the bar. And I think that uh, that's one thing that the Professionalism Committee has done a great job of is getting out there, speaking about the Texas Lawyers' Creed, and reminding people um, about this document. But it all started with Buck Files. The Professionalism Committee of the State Bar had not met for a year when I asked uh, Kenda to take that role, and I told her I wanted it to function as a task force more than just as a committee. And I went to several of the presidents who followed me asking that they continue to appoint her as the Professionalism Chair. So I had the year of seeking the courts, uh, the two courts, um, support in reaffirming the Lawyer's Creed. But when I went away, Kenda stayed there pushing the importance of the Lawyer's Creed and has done so uh, during the time that she was the chair. So I came and went, but she continued what was what was there. And Buck, if if I could follow that up with kind of a personal question, if you don't mind, you know, it's it's it sounds like you've had this commitment to professionalism far before you became state bar president. Was that influenced at all by your time in the Marine Corps? Oh, you better believe it was. I checked into the legal office for the 1st Marine Brigade um, FMF in 1964. My boss was Lieutenant Colonel Hanthorne. He, there we had three young lieutenants. None of us had ever tried a case, and the first thing he told us was, you will never leave a courtroom without shaking hands with your opposing counsel. And to this day, I have never fail to shake hands without regard to whether I won, lost, got killed, was on top. It was just something that was ingrained. I had the same attitude when I was in the legal office in Hawaii, in Okinawa, same thing in Vietnam. We tried cases uh, hard, but we tried them as gentlemen, and um, I was impacted significantly by my experience as a Marine Corps lawyer. Well, let's talk for a second about lawyer-to-lawyer civility, because at least in in my experience, I think that's where the system seems to need the most help. You know, certainly I think lawyers lawyers understand the need to be respectful of judges, at least we hope they do. 
But lawyer to lawyer, I mean, you talked about shaking hands and treating your opposing counsel with respect and dignity. What do you do when you get the, quote, Rambo lawyer on the other side of a case? How do you deal with a person like that? Do you guys have any any experience, either anecdotal or personal? And you know, how do you maintain your own dignity and your own your own commitment to civility when you're dealing with somebody on the other side who maybe doesn't share that same view? Let me give you an example. We were at oral argument at the en banc court for the Fifth Circuit on a case that wound up going to the Supreme Court. The other side was represented by a um, law professor from up in Utah who used to be a federal district judge. He clearly misrepresented the facts in the case. And of course, you can't stand up during oral argument and object. And I was very angry. But I went over and shook hands with him and said, I guess we'll see each other at the Supreme Court. And he looks over and said, we really want to go to the Supreme Court, too. And if you have any difficulty, um, we'll help you with your uh, with your briefs. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so ignoring <laughs> his, his uh, obligation uh, to his client. Actually, he assisted us in responding to the government's response to our uh, petition for cert. But that was an example where we got a tremendous benefit uh, by my following a rule and shaking hands with opposing counsel, even someone who had clearly misrepresented uh, facts to an appellate court. Well, from my perspective, I have the, uh, again, I have the honor of being the district attorney over in Rockwell County. And as the DA, I get to have a lot of prosecutors um, that I can have some influence over. And many of them are younger coming out of law school. And so we use this as an opportunity to um, have mentoring within our own um, office. And I spend a lot of time talking to these uh, young lawyers, especially, about the fact that you can spend your entire life creating a reputation and you can and in five minutes you can lose that and I think that it's important um, when you have somebody on the other side we talk about the fact of you will be professional every time you walk into the courtroom Um, even when somebody makes you angry you will remain professional because that's your duty as a lawyer is to be professional and I think that um, one of the things that they struggle with is is when you have a lawyer that is so unprofessional and feels like they're going to gain some advantage by being so aggressive or so malicious in the courtroom or just, you know, just ugly. And they see the examples of how that does not work for opposing counsel. And if they engage in it, it doesn't work for them. And I think from the perspective of watching a judge that reacts negatively to someone that's being unprofessional in the courtroom, again, maybe in front of that jury. I've seen example after example where juries see someone being unprofessional in the courtroom and and negatively react to that lawyer to the detriment of their case. I remember Fred Hagens told an example one time about that he had a, a really – vitriolic lawyer on the other side. And during deliberations, one of the jurors sent out a message that said, I don't appreciate the fact that you are so aggressive and so mean to not only um, opposing counsel, but also to your own associates. And that lawyer knew from that moment on that his case was going sideways. Um, And so I tell those examples to young lawyers so that they can understand that it is a benefit, in my mind, it is a benefit to being professional, not only in the courtroom, but also in your interaction with other lawyers outside the courtroom. Because again, we're in the criminal practicing world, but if you're unprofessional to a lawyer, if they're unprofessional to us, they are less likely to be able to sit down and have a good conversation about their case um, to someone that wants to listen to them. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think lawyers across the state feel that way, that you know, a professional lawyer is someone that is going to gain by their professionalism. The best lawyers that I know, the best lawyers in the state that I know, and Buck Files is among those, are people that are professional, that get along, that they're going to get along outside the courtroom, inside the courtroom, and when they have to throw the gloves off, and go to and go to to battle. I respect that. I respect the fact that we battle in the courtroom as long as it's done ethically and professionally. Well, it's interesting, you know, that you that you talk about that because one of the edicts in the in the creed is to say, "I will not quarrel over matters of form or style, but I will concentrate on matters of substance." And so, Kenda, it seems like both of you guys are effectively saying, you know, 
fight about the substance, fight about the law, fight over the facts and how the law should be applied, but let's not quibble over over the form issues. But what what happens? Let's add another another element into this mix that we're talking about. So you get a Rambo lawyer on the other side who clearly thinks a lack of civility and professionalism will get him or her some kind of advantage in the in the case. But now what happens if you have a judge? I'm sure it's rare, but what happens when you have a judge who won't step in and admonish that other lawyer? And it's getting to the point where it's creating it's creating too many distractions, not only in the courtroom, but even out of the courtroom with discovery or setting deadlines or what have you. Do you guys have any any advice or any insight into what to do when you are the only one who's noticing the lack of civility and you're trying to maintain your your professionalism, but you might be the only one in the room who's doing so. What do you do then? Lawyers can be inappropriate in the courtroom. They can be personal and accusatory and uncomplimentary. And I think that you just maintain your dignity and behave the way you always do. This is not to say that you can't make your thoughts known to the lawyer outside the courtroom when it's a one-on-one situation. You don't have an audience. You're not embarrassing him in front of someone but you can make it crystal clear that you do not appreciate his conduct and do not intend uh, for it to continue. I've seen that, and I think it works. When we were talking to uh, Fred Hagens and Blackie Holmes and Lamar McCorkle about when they first started talking about creating the Texas Lawyers Creed, they had a wonderful task force that was led by Justice Cook and they talked a lot about these issues, about the, you know, the, the desire to, to have this professionalism and have something written down that was inspirational to lawyers and their profession. And one of the big arguments that they came up against was that people were concerned that having a Texas Lawyers Creed would sterilize the process in some way, would make the practice of law you know, less fun, but also less about advocacy because we can't just go in and everybody shake hands and everybody be sweet and natural. We're we're advocates. We're advocating our position, and it is in uh, many times in direct opposition to uh, the person on the other side. It's an adversarial and process. I, it's an adversarial process, and quite frankly, as a trial lawyer, I appreciate that adversarial process. I appreciate the opportunity to be passionate and zealous about the position that I'm taking in the courtroom. And I think that that argument fell flat after we saw the Texas Lawyers' Creed come about, because we did, we did not see um, lawyers be any less zealous, any less passionate, any less advocates in the courtroom. But there is a way, like the Lawyers' Creed talks about, there's a way to disagree without being disagreeable. There is a way to be advocates and zealous and passionate about our cause without being malicious and ugly. And outside the courtroom, there is a way to advocate on behalf of your client without burying your opposing counsel in discovery that's irrelevant to the case or without pretending or, or, or misleading them about a deposition date or not telling them about a deposition date. That is adverse to my what I believe being a lawyer and my profession is. And I think that um, absolutely I love the fact that lawyers are able to go and be passionate about their cause in the courtroom. But the Texas Lawyers' Creed is not opposite to that. It is It supplements us being passionate, zealous advocates. May I tell a court TV story? We're, we're in trial in Dallas. In case it took 63 days, it was a son who was accused of murdering his mother, and a jury found that uh, the state was, was right in its accusation. A lawyer and I were involved in a hotly contested uh, morning session, He wanted to have me held in contempt. I wanted to have him held in contempt. We take a break, and we get coffee, and we're standing out talking. And the TV camera is on us, and they're getting calls from all over America about how can these people be the way they are in the courtroom and be visiting during a break. And we simply said, we're Texas lawyers. We turn it on. We turn it off. (laughs) And and, and how was that received? Um, Very well. Well, good, good. Glad to hear that. So as we start to wrap up, Any final thoughts? Buck, let's start with you. I go back to the old test. What can you tell a young lawyer about how he ought to behave 
in the courtroom and whether he should be aggressive and whether he should be a Rambo. And the simplest of all advice is just imagine your mother sitting on the front row and would she believe that what you're doing was appropriate. If she would, your conduct is good. If she wouldn't, you ought to take a second look at how you're behaving. Kenda, how about you? I think that it is, and, and again, I, I started in 1992, but it seems to me like it is more difficult um, to practice law with the professionalism than it was in the past. And, and the reason I think it is is because of technology and, and emails and e-filing and the fact that in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you had a secretary that you would dictate a letter to, and if it got really ugly, she'd look at you like, seriously? And you wouldn't send that, you wouldn't send that, that letter. And now it's just so easy to get ramped up about a case, get angry about something that somebody's done and hit that send and you can't take it back. And, and now you, you're going to have to deal with the consequences, which is why I think that it is even more important than it ever has been before for lawyers who have been in this profession for a longer period of time to mentor younger lawyers. Younger lawyers are coming out of law school. There is not, there are not the government jobs that there used to be. There are not the, there's not the placement in law, big law firms like there, there used to be. And so many lawyers are coming out of law school and hanging up their own shingle and, and going into solo practice. And I think as law um, organizations, whether it's the state bar or our local bar associations, we have to do more in the mentoring realm. We have to seek out those those young lawyers and find good mentors to, to attach them to so that they can learn what it is to be a professional lawyer. Because you're absolutely right, Rocky, when you brought up the fact that when we decide that we want to go to law school, we were inspired to go into this profession. And you want to build on that young lawyer's inspiration to do something that makes our world a better place and put them with a lawyer that can cultivate that feeling that they have rather than sending them out forth into the world to be malicious, to be unprofessional, to be ugly. Well, that's great advice all around. That is, unfortunately, though, all the time we have for today. I want to thank my guests, Buck Files and Kenda Culpepper, for joining us. So thank you both. It's been great having you on. Thank you. Thank you. And, of course, I want to thank you for tuning in to our discussion on the Texas Lawyers' Creed and the need for civility in the legal profession. If you like what you heard today, please rate us and review us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Until next time, remember, life's a journey, folks. I'm Rocky Deer, signing off. If you'd like more information about today's show, please visit LegalTalkNetwork.com. Go to TexasBar.com slash podcasts. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts and RSS. Find both the State Bar of Texas and Legal Talk Network on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Or download the free app from Legal Talk Network in Google Play and iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, the State Bar of Texas, Legal Talk Network, or their respective officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, or subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.